Last class, you know, we saw something last class which is quite important. And, and it is very interesting. I mean, he made some personal anecdotes which I, I think are, are, are funny in a way, but are also representative of what may happen. If you have an economy where you increase protection, in fact, what you're doing is you are creating a situation where you will be providing with power to people who can control the system, OK? So one of the key issues that we can talk about is whenever you have a system that is full of protection, that system will empower people to take advantage of that control, OK? And what will bring you is corruption. So there is, there is a certain, there is this feeling that only business people are corrupt, OK? And then there is a feeling on the business community that only government people are corrupt. And what we are seeing is, it depends on the system. What you will have is the possibility of corruption or not on both sides. This is very important, because there is always this discussion that the bad guy is the guy who's across from me. He is the bad guy. And we never think, I can also become a bad guy, OK? I can be part of a system that if institutionally the setup gives conditions for me to move in one direction or the other, I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to be taking advantage of it. And that was the whole point, OK? When you look at the history of why we're talking about free enterprise, free markets, all these things. Basically, it's because people are saying there is going to be an embedded self selfishness, selfishness in people. We are selfish by nature. We want to be taking advantage of things because we want to be better off ourselves. So the whole point of Adam Smith and all these people was if you create an institutional framework in which you take advantage of this interest of each and every one of us, to look for oneself first and then the rest, then you can create the conditions where taking advantage of that selfishness of people, you will be better off as a society. Okay? And the whole point of the discussion that we have had for centuries is, is free market, individual freedom more important than social considerations? And how do you make the balance between the two? So the point that we make, uh, some of us, you know, the liberal sort like myself, what you do is you say, a market structure, the institutional framework of a market structure, is much better in the assignment of resources in the economy than any other system that you can think of. That doesn't mean that there is no role for government. That simply says there is a role for government, but it's a contained role. Because if you give more and more and more power to government, and, and there is no such thing as an entity called government. It's, it's a context where people are in control of government, OK? So when you have a system where some people have a lot of power, it would be natural for that people to try to control the system in their own benefit. Now, I put to you the example of Pemex in Mexico, which is important. Regardless of whether you have a government which is from the right side of the system of society or the left side or the center side, in the end, each and every single government that comes to government, to power, uses Pemex. And Pemex has been used for the past 50 or 60 years as the scapegoat for every single government not to take a definition, which is very important. And the definition is, I need a fiscal reform. I need to go into a complex system of reform where I will be fighting with everybody so that we can come with the right tax system in the economy. But I don't need to do that if I have Pemex. Because since I have Pemex, I can simply milk Pemex, take all the money away from it, and then that allows me to keep a very unsatisf unsatisfactory tax system. Who did this? It was done in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s by governments which were from one particular party. Yeah, but that was not really the point. The point is, even when they had control, total control, 
of Congress, even at the time when one party government controlled also the totality of Congress, they didn't do the reform. Because it was a very complicated reform and it would be rejected by many people in Mexico. It's natural. I mean, I don't like to pay taxes. You don't like to pay taxes. So if someone comes to us and says, you're going to be paying more taxes, you will be rejecting it. But because I had control on Pemex, and because Pemex was very rich, I used Pemex all the time. For what? For my own benefit. Who's, who's my own benefit? The government's benefit. What party is the government? Doesn't matter. It was pre, it's pan, and it could be PRD in our country. You, you will say, well, left, right, it has nothing to do with it. In the end, it is convenient for me to take advantage of it. Okay? As individuals, we are looking for our own benefit before anything else. And so what you have to do is create the institutional framework. What we are saying right now is the best institutional framework, according to a way of looking at the world, is liberal markets. Free markets, free transportation, free everything. And some people are coming back from another current saying, oh, if you do that, you are going to be exploiting people. The reason why I show you the fair trade program is because you can see that you can combine elements in the end in an institutional framework which could create conditions which are very different, still using the same market approach. Okay? So it's not a question of market, it's how you really create the institutional framework around the market that will make a difference. If I give control to people, they will tend to use that control. And so the key question for us is, if I create a market situation, who controls the market? Now, the theory of market tells you that in a perfect competition, everything is fine. And that is the key word, OK? Not all markets are markets of perfect competition. So many markets have some situations that don't allow perfect competition to take place. Whenever a market doesn't have the conditions to be a perfect competition market, then you have to find out what are the elements which are affecting that. So here is an element. I can have a market system, but I give one bureaucrat the power because I institute a tariff to define what kind of goods can come without the tariff and what can come with the tariff. If I do that, Everybody who is competing in that market is not competing in equal conditions. Because if I know the guy, if I bribe the guy, I can bring my product into the market without paying the tariff. If I don't know the guy, if I don't bribe the guy, then I have to compete. And one of the things that struck me a little bit last session is when Paul was talking to us about how business was done in terms of the oil imports that his father, he was talking about that, in the end, if you create the wrong system, even people who wouldn't do it will be bound to offer certain things that are wrong from the corruption point of view, but that because you need that to be competitive in the market, you tend to do it. Okay? It's, it's a true saying that it takes two to dance. Okay? So there is going to be corruption, yeah, but in order to have the corruption, there is someone who offers and there's someone who accepts. So there are two people in that transaction. One is offering money, the other one is taking the money. One is offering the bribe, the other one is taking the bribe. Why do I have to offer you money? Why do I am bribing you? Because you have control on something that will be to my advantage or my disadvantage. It depends. And so one of the things of this whole business is the less control you provide to these kind of bureaucrats, the less corruption you probably will have in your system. It doesn't mean that corruption ends. It's just you will have less corruption because there is less opportunity. Everybody now in Mexico knows that we can bring almost anything we want from the United States or Europe or any other place. So when you get to the border point and the customs people come to you and say, oh, you, this thing cannot go through Mexico, uh, with the exception of weapons and drugs and things of that sort, everything else can go through just a question of how much the tariff will be. The problem is you have no information, okay? But if I'm telling you right now that 
We have a single tariff system in Mexico, and it's 10%, and everybody knows that, then you automatically know one thing. You can bring anything to the border, and if you pay 10% of the price, you can bring it in. And if I give you that information, and if that's the situation, and it's a simple system like that, the possibility of anyone stopping you on the other side and saying, no, 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 you cannot pass it on, says, I'm sorry, it's not a weapon, it's not a drug, these are the things that are forbidden, but the rest are all permitted, and everything pays 10%. Because I have a very simple tariff system. One tariff, 10% across the board. If we were to have that kind of a system, <laughs> you practically end up the possibility of corruption in many, many ways. Because then you walk to the border, you can bring whatever you want. The only thing you have to bring is a note indicating very clearly the price of the thing. You pay 10% and you go in. Okay? So the more you liberate the system, from all these conditions, the better information you can provide, and the simpler that information is, the less possibility of corruption in a system. I'm not saying that it will disappear, it's simply less. Now, that's part of the point of why we believe in free markets, why we believe also in free trade. Because what we are saying is free trade will allow you to simplify all these systems. Okay? But also, if I give you one condition, and everybody knows in the world that it's 10% tariff no matter what, then automatically you provide certainty for people who want to make investments in your country. Because they know that they can bring inputs for all over the world and only pay 10% on those inputs. So maybe you can get, so the less tariffs you have, the less corruption? Yeah. Or? Not because of the tariff but because of the fact that if I know that you have free trade, let, let's assume that the trade between Puebla and Tlaxcala, once you reach the border of the states, which is very close from here, you have to pay 10% for whatever you are going to bring into Tlaxcala because the government of Tlaxcala decided all of a sudden that they are going to be charging to any product coming from outside the state of Tlaxcala 10%, 50% tariff, okay? Two things are gonna happen very quickly, okay? One of them is you're gonna say, well, if I'm gonna set up a fabric, you know, a factory in Tlaxcala, and I need inputs from Puebla, Veracruz, whatever, I'm gonna have to pay 10% for that. But if I put the factory in Puebla, right at the border with Tlaxcala, I don't have to pay 10%, where would you put that? Factory. So you will put it in Puebla. So one of the key questions here is, you want to attract investment, the least conditions you impose, the better off you're going to be for that, okay? So in terms of trade, you want to really attract trade, you want to attract foreign direct investment to your country, the least things that you are putting as conditions, the better off you're going to be. But then the second question is, if I provide now, the people in Tlaxcala, with this fact that they will be charging 10%, and I'm a producer in Puebla, and I go and I know you because you are the customs union official right at the border, and you are my friend, and I walk to you and I say, because you are my friend, let me in without paying the taxes. Look the other way while I get my car through, yeah? and I'll give you 5%. You may be very honest and say, well, of course not, okay? But you know, normally what's gonna happen is if I'm really your friend, it will be difficult for you, just as it is difficult for any one of you when everybody is copying in class to tell me that they are copying, yeah? even though they are doing the wrong thing. And then you will say, well, that's my friend, yeah. But the additionally 5% is not bad, yeah? Okay, because you're my friend, I got my things through with 5%. No one else can do that. Okay, so I'm the one who's going to be profiting because anybody else would pay 10%, I pay only 5%. Immediately, it's to my advantage to give you the 5%. Okay? If I can reduce that to 1% because I only give you a gift every three months, then it is to my advantage and it's to your advantage. We have created the conditions for corruption. Okay? And you may say to me, no, no, everybody is honest in the world. Okay. 
I will assume is true until it hits your pocket. Okay? Uh, not that I'm uh, for corruption, but don't you think that as from an economist's point of view, putting a tariff, if there weren't any tariffs, people would just, you know, move around with their goods and they will have maybe a larger satisfaction or welfare. But also when you put a tariff, the government gets money for products to go and come. One well, second. They pay this guy so he gets a wage. And third, if there's corruption, we're creating wealth or we're creating this in exchange just because. So does the economy see that as I know that they, they don't take it in the beef in the GDP because it's not legal, but it's also welfare creation or not? Think about it. If I create corruption, okay, what I'm doing is I am distorting the decision-making process in any society. Okay? Because what I'm going to do is, if it is not the best option to produce certain thing in certain place, but I can, through a bribe, obtain advantages of doing it, then, in fact, what I'm doing is I'm reducing the general welfare of the economy, okay? Because the, the allocation of resources is not going to be the optimal allocation of resources. It's going to be suboptimal. Now, there is a lot of people saying, oh, yeah, but, you know, corruption is the grease that makes the wheels go faster. The only reason why that's true is because there are conditions that make the wheels go slower. So the question really is not whether corruption is good or bad, because by definition it's bad. And you can demonstrate in many ways, okay? But really what's important to you say, the reason why there is corruption, the reason why I need to grease the wheel, I put it that way, <laughs> is because there is something there which is stuck in this process and is obstructing the wheel. So, it would be much better for society to go and look at what is that is stuck in, that is creating that you know, situation, rather than put grease. Because in the end, the wheel is going to break. So what you go is you go and you take it off. And the point is, it would be much better or not if you take away everything on these controls. And the answer is yes. Now, can you do that all of a sudden in a society which has a series of rules and regulations? No. And so the process of reform which is really what we're talking about, is simply because you are starting from a situation which is already suboptimal. But, you know, for the people who are taking advantage of that, it's optimal. Okay, I mean, give me a break. Here we are, no? I mean, I can tell you, well, how about this? Babies will be born and we will allocate them, not in terms of who his father or mother are, but just by chance. Okay? So, yeah, you may be born from your father and your mother, but since you were born and you really don't know who they are at the beginning, yeah, I'll just take them from you and I'll send you to a different place. Well, this is not a system of allocation that we have in our economy, okay, or in society. You will not accept that. I won't accept that because I want to be from my family, and since I'm the father, I want to keep my baby with me. Okay? So we cannot go to this concept that let's be a full society where everybody is for everybody. Not true. So I will then tend to keep my baby and take care of my baby. Yeah? And once you become my baby, you become part of my family, and you will grow in my family. As you grow in my family, you will get the kind of education and things that I have. But the one thing I'm going to be doing as your father is I'm going to be trying to provide you with the best options possible. Yeah? That's what a normal father will do. So I will try to do that. That will imply that if I'm allowed, I will do things for you that I wouldn't do for the son of another couple, even if they are my friends. Yeah? So I will take advantage, sure. So the system has to create the conditions whereby I can remain having you as my baby, but at the same time, there will be equal opportunity for all babies in the society. Because otherwise, the wealth that you have at the beginning will create conditions that in many ways are unfair to the people who are born from parents who don't have the same level of wealth 
or the same level of education. So what the system has to provide is not the same level of wealth or the same level of education, it's the same level of opportunities for each and every one of the kids. Okay? That's really the role of the system. That implies the role of the public sector is to provide a framework of equal opportunities for everybody. Now, whether you take advantage of that or not is your own decision. Whether you study for the exam or you don't is your personal decision. Okay? But what I have to do is I have to give you the same opportunities, meaning the following. If I have a list of readings and I send that list of readings to half the class and I don't send it to the other half, that's not equal opportunity, okay? Because then the other one either don't know that I send the list of readings or at the same time they will have to do an extra effort to obtain the readings. If your colleagues know that by reading those articles they will get better grade than you, there is a strong chance that the way they will do it is say, ah, sorry, I didn't get it. Okay? <laughs> when they did get it. Now you're going to say, that's not true, it doesn't happen. Say, of course it happens, it happens all over the place. So what I need to do is I need to make sure that if I send the reading to one of you, I send it to everybody else. Now what you, each one will do with that, that's your problem, okay? But you have the same opportunity to read it. Bring that to society. All you are saying is, we need to have the equal opportunity for everybody. The best system for equal opportunity is a free market. Then everybody can get in, can get out, can do whatever. The problem is markets as we know them do not necessarily correspond to perfect competition markets. Because we have monopolies, because we have duopolies, because we have people who have control, because I am the government and I give a concession and only through a concession you can really participate in the market. So whenever you do all those things, you are creating conditions for corruption. Okay? So, the best system is free trade. Why? Because it gives equal opportunity to everyone. And what we have been talking about a little bit along this part of the course is, but it's not true that there is equal opportunity. It's not true that every country has the same structure, infrastructure. And therefore, there is no really such thing as an equal opportunity between countries. So when I put a country to compete with another country, and this doesn't have the infrastructure that this country has, this one is going to be at a disadvantage in terms of trade. And then the answer is yes, but they will both win anyway. Okay? Regarding what you're saying now, and what do you think about the free flow of people? Absolutely, absolutely. Like, people are a resource, like any other resource. So one of the problems of NAFTA is exactly that. One of the problems of NAFTA is I organize a free trade area and I make it free for everything except people. If you do that, then automatically you are creating a condition that doesn't allow the optimal allocation of resources in the whole region, okay? And so you will walk and say, well, because you are not allowing me free movement of people, I'm not going to get into NAFTA. That's wrong. Why? Because you are worse off without NAFTA as it stands today than with NAFTA as it stands today. Could you be better off if you agreed to free movement of people? Yes. But it's very complicated, okay? Economically, I can demonstrate that, but politically, socially, it's very difficult, okay? Because socially, what you're talking about is, all of a sudden you have all these millions of Mexicans who are coming to my place. Now, think the opposite. The reason why we don't have energy agreement in NAFTA is because of this feeling in the Mexican society that oil is ours and we're not going to be allowing the Americans or everybody else to have it. Fully cultural and political. 
nothing to do with economics or the welfare of people. Okay? But in the end, there are things I can do and there are things I can't, okay? I have to convince you to do things. Imagine the thought that you have to lose your left arm, your hand right, yeah? Okay, so I'm going to take your left arm. In order to save your life, I have to cut your left arm. You feel no pain, and your wife says, what do you mean? Says, well, I made this x-ray from you, and, every, and you have this incredible illness. I have to cut your arm. You will, you will say, wait, 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 let me check with someone else, okay, before you do that. And so there are many things which exist in a society when you go into the opening of your economy that will be deterrence to the real opening because people will lose from that opening and people will win. Normally, the losses are felt very quickly. The benefits are felt in the long term. Okay? So you also have a temporality problem right there. People saying, wait, wait, I'm going to lose my job right now. Yeah, but you will get a better job in the next 10 years. Huh? <laughs> you know what? I have a good job right now. So unless you have also a system that will allow me to feel that I'm not going to lose in the process, I will do it. But I cannot have that kind of system because whenever I open the economy, you will have immediate competition from products that come from outside. Okay? So it becomes very complicated, not because it is not theoretically right, but because in practice, <laughs> you're going to have all those opposition groups, which makes sense. All of them are looking for what? For their own self-interest. That's the first thing you think of. Me, my family. There was a question? Yes. Uh, uh, no, I was going to say like that. Like, if there is free uh, trade of people, would it like all the people want to go to the States or something? You would be surprised how many Americans would like to come to Mexico. Okay? And, and so the question is simply give it time and you will see what happens. But in the initial wave, yeah, in the initial wave, there is going to be more Mexicans going to the United States than Americans going to Mexico. But then the second wave is this. Okay, we have all these engineers that we don't have in Mexico. We have them in the United States. They will say, okay, if you have this advantage, I'll go to work in Mexico. And then the engineers in Mexico are going to feel threatened. And so they're going to say, no, 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 don't let them in. And in the end, interest groups will defend each other. And they will say, I'm defending my interest. And they will then transform that into a following speech. It is in the interest of Mexico that we don't lose these jobs. Mexicana de Asian, yeah? Has it been flying for the past two years? And yet we still have people waiting to be saved in Mexicana de Asian. This should be close about two years ago. Sindicato Mexicano de Electricistas. They are still fighting, going to the streets and doing whatever. We just had the ruling of the Supreme Court that it was legal what happened. But they fought for two years, okay? And they came out and said, well, now we're going to go to the international court. Well, I mean, they, the whole allegation at the beginning was sovereign nations, and we are really going against the sovereignty of Mexico and this and that. Then they lost. They went all through the natural system in Mexico until the Supreme Court. They lost in the Supreme Court. Now they're going to go to international. These are the same people who defend sovereignty of the nation. But now they're going to go to the international court. And no, they have the right. No problem. But then they have to be consistent. Either you really believe in international or you are national. Decide. Now, if you believe in international for the decision on the law regarding whether it was fair, legal, or not what you suffer, then you should also accept that any foreigner can make investments in Mexico in the electricity sector. But go and ask them that. And they will say, no way. Well, a minute. You mean you are going to go to the international court to challenge the ruling of the Supreme Court of Mexico regarding what happened to you, but you are not willing to allow a foreigner to come and invest in Mexico? doesn't sound coherent. Well, we are not coherent when it comes to our own interests, OK? But corruption happens not because we have the gene of corruption in our bodies, OK? We probably do. But the point is, if I create a system 
that encourages this type of behavior, people will behave this way. And you can tell me, no, look, I mean, I'm very honest, and I will never do it. You know, there is a saying in Spanish, en el arca abierta, el justo peca. Okay, so open this and show the money and tell them that there is no one around him, and you will see whether he takes the money or not. Okay, so let's then finish this section, okay? And I'm going to be using this module. It's called the WTO Economics Underpinnings. You can find it if you go into the WTO webpage. What basically we know about trade is the three most important insights from the theory of international trade are there are gains from trade. We all win when we trade. Trade is therefore mutually beneficial. Does it mean that we get exactly the same benefits? No. But it's mutually beneficial. I'm going to be better off and you're going to be better off. I may be better, better off than you, and you're only better off, but the two of us have the world better in there, okay? And the third one is, trade has income redistribution effects. So in the initial stage, there is going to be some losers. But in the end, gains from trade outweigh the losses that we have. This has to be very important to you, because what happens is, in the initial stage, if I was a closed economy, the people who are making a benefit out of having a closed economy are going to be losing. Yeah? I'm a producer of cars in Mexico. I'm very inefficient, but I'm the only one who can sell cars in Mexico. The car is worth $20,000, $30,000, $40,000. But I'm the only one who sells cars in Mexico because no one else can bring them from any place. If I'm the only one who can sell cars in Mexico, the moment that I open the market and I allow free trade of cars, the first one who's going to lose is going to be the man or the woman who was producing cars. Okay? At that point, there is an income redistribution effect. The money that was coming to the people in the car industry. The ones who worked there and had good wages. The ones who were the investors and had good profits from the fact there was no trade on cars are going to be immediately hit and lose that money. Therefore, there is first an income redistribution between the foreigner and the national, but secondly, What's going to happen is many other industries that could not thrive because all the money was being used for that are going to start producing and some people are going to start winning in other industries. Okay? And since some of them will end up exporting also, they will be getting the benefits of the opening of trade. There is an income redistribution process when you open the economy, when you go into free trade. Where do the gains come from? First, they come from the fact that you have a better utilization of resources. Okay? This is what's called specialization. This is the allocation of resources that we're talking about. I'm going to be using now the resources of my society better off than before because I don't have the distortion of price that I used to have before. And therefore, I know that this product is no longer a product I'm going to be producing. I'm going to go and produce something else. When I do that, I'm specializing myself in better of things. So why are, you you know, why are you students of international business? Because your advantages are better than if I were to send you for music or dance. Yeah? But all of you can dance. Yes. It's not a question of whether I can dance or I cannot dance is that if I dance, I'm going to look very awkward. And there are people there dancing who do it very, very well. Yeah, but you know what? The 15 of us can put a show, and we can sing, and we can dance. It probably will be terrible. But if we are the only show in town, people will have to listen to us. Yeah? 
And then all of a sudden it comes, this show comes from outside, and they are really good. They jump faster than we do. They sing better than we do. But we can sing and dance. Yeah, but is that the best use of our abilities? Probably not. OK, so we begin then says, OK, let's go for international business. And let the other guys do the dancing and whatever. And what we'll do from now on is, because we are international business, we're going to be managing them. And we're going to be making a profit of that. And they will make a profit too. Income redistribution, specialization in what we do best. And therefore, all of us will gain. OK? So you get, because of the specialization, according to comparative advantage, what I'm better than the other one. And you also, because of economies of scale. I have now a larger market than I used to have before. So I can do it better. See? Whereas before, there was only 20 people, our families, who will come to see us in this show. The one that we bring the other people, we will have the families of many people who will be willing to pay to see the other show. Economies of scale. What happens then is, I have a larger market than I used to have before. I have economies of scale. I can produce at a lower cost because I have a larger market. And of course, once I enter into this, as a society, I also have a broader variety of goods and services that I can dispose of. As a consumer, I win. I have better cars than I used to have before. I have better prices than I used to have before. And I am better off than I used to be before. And of course, once we see the competition, we start thinking, how can I be best? And so it also promotes innovation and technology transfer. Okay? These are the reasons why we are going to be better off than we were before. These are the gains for society. The gains from specialization is what we talk right now, comparative advantage. Okay? I am better in this. Yeah, I can do the other thing, but I'm much better in this. By using my comparative advantage, I'm going to be more productive than I was when I was not using that in which I'm best. But the second thing is what's called the opportunity cost. And the opportunity cost is the cost of doing or not doing a thing. Okay? So your opportunity cost is very simple. Is what is my opportunity cost between studying a PhD or not studying a PhD? If I go and I do a PhD, okay, I would have to keep on studying for the next five years. And therefore, all the pleasures of life working and making money, and during the next four or five years, I forego so that I can do my studies. There is an opportunity cost to everything that we do. It's the thing that I could have done if I hadn't done what I did. Okay? This is very important. And this is a very economic, economist point of view. The problem is the opportunity cost of doing or not doing a thing will differ if I have different technologies. Okay? If I have a very advanced technology, then the opportunity cost probably will be very low. If I have a different technology, it will be very high. Opportunity cost is very important for you whenever you're in business. Because it really means, if I'm going to be using this money for this purpose, what else could I have done with that money? And that will be my opportunity cost. It's all of those things that I couldn't do because I'm doing this. OK? And it's important because you have to understand that. And so the theory of comparative advantage simply says that when two economies specialize in producing the goods in which they have a comparative advantage, both economies gain from trade, even if one country has an absolute advantage in both goods. I'm very good in doing the two things, yes. But if you specialize yourself in doing the one that you are best, you will be much better off than if you try to do the two of them. Think about an athlete. He can be or she can be very good at tennis and basketball. But if he or she is very, very good in tennis and just good in basketball, he will make more money by specializing in tennis rather than trying to play the two games. Okay? And so it's just like that. It's, there is a point where you say, look, take advantage of that in which you will be the best all the time. Okay? And let the other person do the other part. 
and the two of you will be winning by doing that. This is a very important part because it really is the basis for trade and why we live in trade. So what we're talking about is that comparative advantage, and this article says, is arguably the single most powerful insight into economics, okay? This is from the readings that you have. So suppose country A is better than country B at making automobiles, and country B is better than country A at making breath. It is obvious, the academics will say trivial, that both will benefit if A specializes in automobile and B specializes in bread, and they traded products. This is what's called absolute advantage, okay? I am better than you in one thing, so I specialize in that. You are better than me in the other thing. You specialize in that. It's very obvious, it's trivial to come to the conclusion that we are going to be better off if we specialize in what we are best. But this is the question that David Ricardo asked after Alan Smith had said this. He says, what if a country is bad at making everything? No, what if it's good? What if it is bad? Okay. Will trade drive all producers out of business? And the answer, according to Ricardo, is no. The reason is the principle of comparative advantage. Even if we are worse off in everything than any other country, if we're going to trade, we're going to be winning. Not all of us are going to be out of the business. Okay? So this Country A and B will still stand to benefit from trading with each other, even if A is better than B at making everything. If A is much more superior at making automobiles and only slightly superior at making bread, then A should still invest resources in what it does best, producing automobiles and export the product to B, and B should invest in what it does best, making bread and export that product to A, even if it is not as efficient of A. Both are going to win from this situation. This is the famous theory of comparative advantage, which you should have seen long time ago. It's from David Ricardo. It's one of the most absolute accepted principles, and this is the reason why we believe. There's something he says, says it is also one of the most misunderstood among non-economists, because it's confused with absolute advantage. Okay? It's, it's counter-natural. If I'm better than you at everything, I should be doing everything. If you do that, you are going to be worse off. No, I don't understand that. If I'm better, I should be doing better. I'm going to run 100 meters and 300 meters and 600 meters and 900 meters and 2 kilometers because I'm good, I'm better than everybody else. Yeah, well, you are going to be better off if you dedicate yourself to 100 meters because what's going to happen to you there, which is the best, 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 you're going to be running at 9.3 seconds. And that's going to be the world record that no one is going to be able to beat. Whereas if you run 3,000 meters, 4,000 meters, 5,000 meters, it's a different kind of race. Yes, you are better than it, but you will not be setting the world record in that one. Concentrate on where you will make the better world record. But this is very difficult for people to understand, okay? Whenever you're going to be discussing with people, they're going to be using absolute advantage all the time. And they will say to you, the Chinese are going to wipe us out of this. Because if we open our economy, the Chinese will destroy us. And it's not true. It won't happen. Oh, yeah, they will destroy you in a lot of products. But you probably will be defending yourself in others. So that's really the question, OK? The question is, if you believe in comparative advantage, you believe in threat. If you don't believe in comparative advantage, it's very difficult to convince you that trade is good. And we can explain it in many ways. But if you think about it, as it says right there, you will see that's true. However, there's been modifications to the principle of David Ricard. One of them is a specialization for difference in endowments. And this is called the factor proportion theory and also the heckscher hollin model. We were looking at outputs up until now. Now we're looking at inputs. What do you have as resources? So Excel and Hollin came to the conclusion that comparative advantage depends on the country's relative endowment of production factors, capital, labor, land. Okay? All, all that economists have been doing over time is complicating things, making it a little bit more complicated so that you don't understand. The whole point is, if I have more labor than you do, then what's going to happen is whatever requires more labor input, 
I'm going to be better than you. Okay? And if you are richer than I am, then capital is important because you have more capital than I do. Then products that require capital, you are going to be better off than I am. So it's not only a question of comparative advantage in the sense of production is, where is it that I have the strongest endowment? And if it is labor, if it is capital, or if it is technology, then I need to specialize in that. Because that's where I will be better off. And that's how the whole society will be better off. And so in a closed economy, the goods that use more intensively, the relative abundant factor will be relatively cheaper. But with trade, the prices of the trade goods will be the same across countries. And the labor-intensive country will export the labor-intensive good. Now, this has been demonstrated over and over and over again. This is what the Chinese are doing, yeah? Except now, labor is not becoming the most important factor. Because as the Chinese economy started really going in growth, they began creating other goods. And those other goods, now capital and technology, is becoming also important in that society. And you can see the transformation of that society. And what you can see then is, because the prices of the traded goods will be the same all over the place, then it becomes now more interesting for the Chinese to go into technology-oriented goods rather than labor-oriented goods. Because in relative terms, they have more and more and more capital. Therefore, it's changing the endowment proportion in their society. Do you follow this one? Or? Yeah. So other thing that's important for you to understand is nothing is static. While I could be good at some point, I may not be as good later on. And so maybe I should be changing my production system also over time. Yes. And that complicates life even worse, even more. So this is the factor proportion theory of these guys who refine the comparative of that. Yes? It remains labor in many ways, yes. But let's assume that we started in China with zero technology and lots of labor. In the initial stages of development, therefore, of that economy, they used labor and they began producing everything that was labor intensive. Companies from outside came, made investment. And so capital came from outside, created the conditions for labor to be utilized, and you produced the good in China and exported that good. Okay? As you kept doing that, the Chinese had more income. As the Chinese had more income but nothing to spend it in, they saved. The savings rate of China for a long period of time was 40% of GDP. Okay? What we're talking about is 40 cents over a peso you save. Well, I'll bet you, you don't do that. Okay? So as you move into the process, you start having savings. As you start having savings, you have capital. As you have capital, your capital endowment has been increasing faster than your labor endowment. As you do that, over time, the Chinese economy has been transforming itself in terms of this concept. The proportion of capital has been increasing. The proportion of labor has remained practically the same the proportion of different endowments has switched in favor slowly of capital because that's one that's increasing faster than labor. And so the factor endowments of that economy over time are switching into capital. Okay? Doesn't mean that they don't have a lot of labor. Yes, they have a lot of labor still. But the capital endowment of that society has been increasing for the past 25 years at a very high rate. And so the factors and the proportion of endowments of these two factors has been changing over time. Whereas it was zero before, now it represents 40%. Okay, factor, still more labor than capital, yes. But the proportion of capital compared to 25 years ago is much higher than it used to be. Okay. If you take those two, that's fine. And then you say, well, what's happening right now in the China and the Chinese economy? The Chinese economy now is moving into innovation into new technology, 
into discovery of new things. Knowledge is becoming now important in the Chinese economy. Okay? Because this is the third stage of what they are doing right now. They are more and more and more moving into research, development, knowledge. Again, the factor endowment is switching. Because now they're having more knowledge than they used to have. Still in proportion to the two is less than, yes. But now it's very different proportion from what it was 25 years ago. Every society will go through that. And what it will imply is, as you grow and you have all these things, you're going to be having this factor of production endowment changing. But the one thing that doesn't change is the price of the goods that are traded, because they are general market all over the world, same price. So as your wages increase in proportion to the cost of capital, you are going to be less competitive in those products that require labor intensive. And that's why the Chinese economy is now switching from labor intensive to technology capital intensive. Yes. So basically this theory has a lot to do with the convergence theory? In many ways there are two different aspects, but this one really what explains is comparative advantage has to take into consideration in addition to the things that you were saying of final product goods, what is the factor endowment? and how that moves over time. This is very important because what it implies is, yes, you can say that you are better at doing these things, but over time, your endowments, the inputs that you have, may be switching in proportion. As they switch in proportion, you are going to be moving. Even if you remain with a huge labor force, larger than the one in the United States, because of the increase of your capital, you are going to move into more technology-oriented, capital-oriented goods for exports. Yeah. Over time, part of the problem is I'm going to be paying better off in wages, sure, because I'm moving into more value-added products and you request more money to keep working. That's a different thing. It's, it's fact is everything will go and become the same if we allow free trade. But having said that, what will you specialize in over time, depends on your factor endowment and the proportion of your factor endowments, what goods you will be specializing in, okay? It's, it's a refinement of the comparative advantage, looking now at the size, at the side of inputs, okay? Factor endowment. And so, as you get more capital in your society, you will be switching towards capital-oriented goods, okay? As you get into knowledge, which is the new, you will get more to that. And so this is what happens slowly. Now, there is lots of studies demonstrating that this is true, statistically, empirically doing it. But again, what we said is that trade affects income distribution. So the important insight is that even though each country gains overall, there are gainers and losers within each country. Once you have gainers and losers, you have people for and people against trade. Okay? Whoever loses is against. Whoever wins is for. Who are the ones who win the most? Consumers. So we have a problem here. Whereas the benefits will be diffused among all the consumers in society, the losses will be concentrated on those who lose their jobs, lose their companies. Okay? And so you're going to have also a political struggle once you go into that. The country only gains overall. Yeah, every, every consumer is better off than it used to be before. Yeah, but the ones who lost their job, you know who they are. Okay. So there is another theorem called the Stolper-Samuelson theorem, which is that the factors which are used intensively in the exporting sector will gain. Those employed in the import competing sector will lose, which, yeah, is kind of... If I used to produce this good and now it comes from outside at a lower price, I'm going to lose. So this simply says that the factors, not only the owners of the companies, the factors, labor, capital, etc., which was being used in the export sector will be losing. So the losses will be felt by those factors which were being used in the 
products that will be displaced by imports. Okay? Who's going to win? Those who now have competition. Who's going to win? If I'm going to be having a larger market, I'm going to be better off than before. Okay? I'm exporting, so all of a sudden I won a huge market. But I was producing for the domestic market, and I'm less competitive than anyone producing the same good outside and all gets in. I'm losing. But not only I, I am losing and everybody else who is with me. Everybody who works in there, who put capital in there, who, all of them are going to lose. So who are the losers? Those guys. Who are the winners? The other guys. How fast can you increase the size of your factory? It will take time. How fast do you have to close your factory? Instantly. The impact of the loss is very quick. The benefit of the win takes time. Um, I was wondering, uh, because I think uh, Japan, for example, imports like, almost all their like, products, don't, uh, but they also export. So like, for example, in Japan, how does it work this? Like, even though they are importing like, so many things, how come they are still like one of like the biggest economies and everything? Because it's not a question of balance of payments. It's a question of can I have my production process in those things where I am getting the best use of my inputs? And if that's the case, then the value added I'm, get, I'm going to be getting and the benefits of that is going to be very large. That will allow me to pay for the rest. Okay? And then I have some change. I pay for everything and I keep the change. Hmm? It's, um, people are very concerned about these things, but, but they are not real. Okay? It's, if I import food, two questions is, what is the cost of producing at home versus the cost of importing from abroad. The cost is 3,000 if I produce it here. The cost is 2,000 if I bring it from outside. Should I buy producing here or bringing it out? Easy solution on this one. Bring it from outside. Then comes your question. How do you pay for it? Yeah? <laughs> Yeah, but in order for me to do that, I need to pay 2000 And the question is, all the resources which I used to utilize to produce this 3000 this cost, how am I going to be reassigning, reallocating those resources? I'm going to be reallocating them to the goods in which I am very good. So the question is, I'm going to use now 3,000 resources to these goods in which I'm very good, and they have a market outside. If they produce me because they have higher value added in which I'm going to be doing, now I'm going to be making cars rather than making food. If I go and I make the cars and everybody wants them, and I get from the same investment 6,000, because now I'm producing cars, then, as an economy, I'm better off because now I have an income of 6,000 and I have an expenditure of 2,000. But think about this. If I can do that, it's because the production of cars was very expensive in other places. So what I can do is I can say, I'm not going to be that bad. What I will do is I'm going to use my resources and those resources I'm going to sell in 4,000 or whatever. So I'm going to be very competitive, internationally speaking. And I still have some change, 2,000, OK? The reason why I'm going to make it in 4,000 is because this will really bring me the customer from outside. They will buy it, because they were paying 6,000 before. I'm going to offer them in 4,000. Since I offer them in 4,000, they will buy it. They are going to be better off. I am going to be better off. They are going to be better off because they want the 2,000. I'm going to be better off because I won 2,000, and I still have food. So everything was nice, yeah? Except someone walks and says, but you know what? 
Now we depend on the gringos for our food. And this is very dangerous because if they get mad at us, they will simply stop sending food to us. And if they don't send food to us, we will starve to death. So don't do that. The most important thing is to have sovereignty and freedom from imports in food. Let's waste our resources. This is a very nationalistic approach, OK? And it's also one that injects fear in people. So what it's telling people is, now we depend on the Americans for our food. Just imagine that all of a sudden they stop sending us food. They will have us on our knees immediately. There is going to be no foreign policy that we can do. We will have to obey them and do whatever they want. OK, that's a different concept. If you're going to be following that, you're going to be worse off. You want to pay for that, pay for that. But you will always be better with free trade. But I don't want to depend from the Americans. Well, that's, that implies, do you want to depend from the Argentinians? Yes or no? Yes, I will depend from the Argentinians. And then they impose a tariff on exports of meat. Because what they will say, as the government of Argentina did about three years ago, is Argentinians love meat. And therefore, the meat that is produced in Argentina will stay in Argentina. So wait a minute. So we were making this business about trade. And all of a sudden, you change the rules on me. That's why we need a system, which is what we're going to be seeing in the next section, a system that will guarantee me the rules of the game. So otherwise, yes, you can do a crazy thing like that. And politicians do crazy things, OK? Don't you think that that nationalistic feeling is kind of created um, from, well, they teach us that the set books about, you know, the and the we fought for that, and people cried and gave them money. So maybe it start would be changing the, the textbooks, right? Yeah, but in order for, to change the textbooks, you have to put our heroes in the right context, OK? We have a series of people who were at the, this was 1800s, OK? So we have people in the 1800s, and they took actions in the 1800s that correspond to the 1800s. And it is right for our history books to tell us what they did. This is absolutely correct. But I have to remember that they were people of the 1800s. Okay? And I will assume that people like that, if I were to bring him or her to the 21st century, we look at the world and say, the things that we used to do in the 18th century make no sense, or the 19th century make no sense. We are going to be doing differently. Because they were people who understood their time and what they needed to do. The problem is, if I don't understand that, and I still want to use their scheme and mentality of the 19th century to solve problems of the 21st century, then history will really pull me back. And I will not do the things I need to do. So yes, we need to learn our history. This is very important. And we also have to understand that this is the 21st century. And yes, the Americans, when they invaded Mexico in the 1800s and they took away half our land, were terrible. Yeah, but that was in the 1800s. What am I going to do now? I'm going to go back and say, give me back all the half of my territory. I mean, this is not some nonsense. So what you say to the Americans today is, look, guys, we're going to be better off. We have no borders. This is 21st century. Why do I want this border in between you and I? Makes no sense. Uh, yeah, but the Americans are making a wall. Oh, God. What do you make the wall for? Do you think that will stop the narco traffic and for this and that? That's not what's going to stop them. But I mean, if that gives you a feeling of, well, these are the Americans of the 21st century, OK? They have never been attacked on their soil and territory except by our hero, yeah? who was the only invader of the United States until the bombing of the Twin Towers. Villa. 
He was the only one who had made a raid, got into American territory, hit them there, and come back. Well, I'm going to tell you something that you all forgot. When the Hurricane Katrina, the American government allowed the Mexican army to go in full uniform into the United States. And we sent troops into Houston to help them with the problem that they were facing in the Katrina situation. No one remembers that anymore. And I was, at the time, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and I was super happy because I told everybody, the only reason why we're going to do this is to demonstrate the difference between the 21st century and the 1800s. So we sent troops. Yeah, they were there to help because DMC3, which is our system of going immediately after all these urgent, terrible situations, is very efficient. And the Americans knew that. And given the problems they were facing already in Houston and in New Orleans and all that, they accepted that we send a group of people. And why also? Because they spoke Spanish. And there were many people speaking Spanish in all these areas, which didn't speak English. And therefore, they needed support. And it was very difficult for the Americans, but they accepted it. Okay? 21st century. Otherwise, they would say, no, you're invading our territory. And so, we're not invading. This was an agreement. We're sending our troops there. And they're going to be helping in the rescue efforts after Katrina in Houston, in New Orleans. It is raised there and exists. 21st century demands that we think 21st century. But don't forget your history. No, don't forget your history. That's important in terms of our own culture. But our future is not going to be what our past was unless we insist on keeping the past as the rule. Don't do that, OK? I mean, Benito Juarez is great. And he's one of the people that I really think was one of the best governments that we have. The reform legislation is impressive for the time. Very important also for the modernization of Mexico in the 1800s. Yes. But, so what are we going to do now? Well, give me back my land? I mean, give me a break. So we have to change on that, OK? Now, trade between similar countries, there is something that's happening in the world now. It's called intra-industry trade, OK? So one of the other big changes that we are facing is, as you move into the modern world, trade is switching to something called intra-industry, which implies really economies of scale. Average costs decrease with the scale of production. And therefore, more and more and more and more are going to have large companies which will use inputs from different places. Most of the trade that's taking place today takes place between companies which are the same. Okay? I am Boeing Corporation. I am producing a plane, and I'm bringing inputs from all over the world to produce the plane. This is intra-trade. Same trade, industrial. I'm going to be, what is really pulling now trade is the production of these goods, intra-trade. Inputs to get outputs. You saw that in the video when the guy was asking, can we call this product a product from Thailand or from this? No longer, OK? So most of the trade occurs now between similar countries, between one quarter and one and a half of total trade is intra-industry trade. Okay? What's happening in the world is this is really the main engine of trade. Trade between goods that fall in the same industrial classification, particularly true if we consider trade among developed countries and in particular trade in manufacturing. In that case, intra-industry trade is most of the trade occurring, and the hexon hauling and Ricardian model do not explain intra-industry trade. OK? This is very important. Because there are the little modifications that are happening. All of a sudden, we realize all of these theories that I have don't really seem to fit, because what has been changing is the production process. OK? And so. Gains from faster innovation and technology transfer is what's happening nowadays. Trade enhances the incentive through competition and scale. And that means I am really innovating. As I do that, what I'm going to be having is many other channels through which things are happening. One of them is called reverse engineering. 
I learned how to do the thing, and I can do it cheaper. So what I'm going to be doing is I take your car, and I disarm the car, and I figure out how it works, and then I do it better than you. If I can do it better than you, then reverse engineering is going to help me. Okay? It's, it's, I'm not looking at things going from inputs into output. I'm looking at the output and saying, what do, we, what do I need in inputs? And as I do that, I learn. As I learn, I become good. As I become good, I can do that. I'm also friends of someone who discovered this and that. We change, and we bring FDI. So many of the things that are happening now that is trade is really helping technology transfer. Okay? And you can see that. Look what's happening in China. The Chinese are producing cars now. Chinese are doing many things, yeah? And we should be doing the same, yes. And we do it. Our automobile industry is very important now. Many of the designs of many of the pieces of the cars are made in Mexico now. They're not made in the United States or a place. Okay? More and more we're doing things here because it's happening. And so foreign direct investment brings now changes in that. And if you look at what was happening for a while, many companies will set up the research areas of their companies where it will be cheaper to do research. So if I have very good engineers in India, I will set up my engineer company in India with Indian engineers because that will be cheaper for me than have it in the United States. I am transferring technology through foreign direct investment. It doesn't go the other way around. People feel the other way that I'm going to be exploited. No, what's happening really is by having more and more trade, I'm transferring more and more technology to your country. Okay? We are a country where technology is very important because of this. But then, of course, there are adjustment costs, okay? which is the reallocation that we saw. And the cost will depend on whether your credit market functions well, because if all of a sudden I have a larger market, but I don't have credit to make the investments to increase my production size, labor market rules, how quick can I fire people, hire people, train people? Quality of the infrastructure. Do I really have the infrastructure to have larger volumes of trade going out in? The quality of the domestic institutions. Am I going to have to be given bribes or not, or do the or do that? And the credibility of whatever reform you are imposing. Okay? <clears throat> so the adjustment costs are very clear. Yes, there are adjustment costs, and they will be higher or lower depending on how the structure of these things are. And that's the role of the national government. Okay? What they need to do is minimize costs. They need to minimize costs by facilitating the adjustment process, defining an appropriate pace for reforms, underpinning trade reforms by international commitments to increase their credibility, and use export promotion schemes. And they need to implement policies to compensate those who lose, social safety nets, and appropriate redistributed tax system. If you don't do this, then this is bad. Then we end up with the richest man in the world. Okay? It's not wrong, it's just that it shouldn't have happened. We should have 20 of the 50 richest men. Yeah. Because then there is resentment in the people, okay? And so the instruments of trade policy are tariffs, quotas, export subsidies and any other policy induced trade cost, standards, customs clearance, etc. Trade is not just a question of tariffs and quotas. As Paul Mayo was telling us last class, NTVs, non-trade barriers, which are not so visible as this, do exist. If I have a norm, in order to have this light, it has to consume no more than 10 values, watts. If that's what I impose, then I have to produce a light bulb that consumes exactly 10 watts. Okay? So I'm not saying that you cannot import this thing to Mexico. All I'm saying is it has to consume exactly 10 watts. Well, that's a barrier, OK? So what if I send one from 9 or 11? It has to be 10. All of those who are not 10 cannot get into the country. 
Not because I'm saying that you cannot bring them, it's that you cannot use it because they don't meet the standards that I impose. And then I impose my own standards, you impose your own standards. Companies who are producing for your market adapt to your standards. When they want to export, the problem is you have different standards in your country. And so I need to create two production lines, one for your country, one for my country. That's very expensive. Okay. So what you want to do is simplify the norms, make them all general. Uh, but if you do that, then you are abiding to the American norm system, and you should not be allowed. OK. Yeah, well, is it better or worse? Well, let's negotiate. We also are sovereign. We are also, yes, but is it better or worse if you allow your norms to be the same ones as the American norms? If I want to export to the United States, then I will adapt. They are the larger market, so I accept that. You should not accept that because, politically speaking, ah, well, it's a political discussion. It's not an economic discussion, OK? But I will impose norms. That's, those are new sources of trade barriers. And so you have the impact of the tariff. The tariff will increase the domestic price and therefore will bring a fall on imports. In the case of a large country, the world price fall are terms of trade gains. Okay? They don't have that problem. In your case, the world price fix, you have no terms of trade wins because you cannot alter the price. You are a small country. If you're a big country, you can do it. If you're a small, you can't. The tariff revenue goes for the government, which is what you were saying a little while ago. Yeah. And the tariff revenue goes for the government. And the question is, should this be a source of income for the government? Consumer lose, consumer lose. Producers gain, producers gain. Here it's not clear whether you're going to win because you have this world price control. Here, you're going to be losing. Welfare. Okay. We're all going to be worse off because we can consume less. So we're going to be worse off. I'm going to give you, send you this, and you can read this. This is the impact of that tariff. Okay? What people talk about, consumer lose or consumer win, are these spaces. So take a look at it when I send it to you. And the whole point made in this one, which is a static economics, is when you look at these things, you will see where once the price goes down, you win consumer welfare. Once the price goes up, you lose consumer welfare. OK? I'll send you this. You are supposed to know this, but you will read it. So why do they impose then import tariffs on oh, political economy? You come to me and you say, I'm going to be losing my job. Come on, guy. We are 10,000. I'm going to stop the streets of Puebla. And I get scared. Mm. Oh, OK. Mm. Economic arguments, terms of trade. They are changing terms of trade in my favor. Also through infant industry argument. This is the way to help industry to grow. Strategic trade policy. We are going to be moving into a strategy and helping to become competitive. And so let me protect my people so they can really win the market, become efficient, and then they will go out. Well, people never become efficient if you tell them that they don't need to study. Yeah? If I say to you, don't worry, don't study, I'll give you 10. Of course, you will all study and do everything. Yeah. Fiscal revenue and income distribution. Okay? These are all arguments, and we're going to be seeing them along the course. And then, of course, the final question, which is trade creation against trade diversion. Okay? This is a very important concept on what we are going to be looking at right now. As we move from global free trade into regional trade agreements, preferential trade agreements, the key question that's been asked all over the place is, are those better or worse? The last class, Paul said that he and I have a big difference. Okay? But he doesn't believe anymore in WTO, and he believes in regional trade agreements. That comes from practitioners, from practicing the trade. Okay? He spent five years in Geneva, as he said, 
flying back and forth, back and forth between Washington and Geneva, trying to support, putting these models to place, playing games with the model, showing all these things, and then what he saw is, and nothing happened. I was the chairman of the Doha round in Cancun. And as we were discussing, this is 3,000 people, okay? As we were discussing this thing, all of a sudden, I, at some point, around 3 o'clock in the morning one day, I said, end of story, we're not going to be making any because three particular countries don't want to do the things. And they keep boycotting the whole thing. <clears throat> but because the WTO rules are either everyone or no one, <clears throat> so small country, think of the smallest you can think of. San Marino, you know where it is? <coughs> the Fiji Islands, okay? I mean, I'm, I'm joking a little bit. But a very small country can stop the negotiation. And it doesn't make sense. <coughs> and so the question that we're going to be asking is, as you move into regional trade agreements, is that better for the world or worse for the world? In many cases, it's going to be worse for the world, as you presented in your debate. But in the end, maybe the only way that we can make progress. But it's not the best way. Yeah, well, but there is one thing called feasibility. And so if the other one is impossible, given political conditions, why should I insist? Maybe the best solution then is to demonstrate everybody through regional trade agreements, through preferential trade agreements, through bilateral agreements, that things work and we are better off. <clears throat> and then let them knock at my door so that we can increase more and more and more the size of countries. Okay? There is something called reciprocity rule that we are going to be looking at, which implies if I give concessions to one country, under WTO rules, I have to give it the same concessions to everybody. Okay? Subsidiarity is very important in that part. Any questions? We are entering now into the second part, second section. You have this in your, <coughs> in your syllabus, and these are the readings that I'm going to be sending to you today. Okay? These are the readings for this section that we're going to get into. What we're going to be talking about is really what I call typology. We're not going to be discussing yet each one of them in detail. We're simply saying, what is the difference between GATT and WTO? What kind of structures do we have? What are the differences in the structures? What is a preferential trade agreement? Bilateral versus multilateral. What is a custom unions? What is integration and trade? What are free trade areas? What are monetary unions? And then we can take a look at this. These are types of agreements. That's why I'm calling this a typology. Then we will get into NAFTA and what it means. But these ones are, if I do NAFTA, what kind of an agreement is that? How is NAFTA different from a customs union? Okay. What's the difference between the NAFTA agreement and a customs union? What would have happened if we had taken a customs union rather than a NAFTA agreement? Okay. We really did a free trade agreement. We didn't do a customs union agreement. What would have been the difference between the two? Okay. And these are the readings I will give you. We're going to be rushing a little bit because we lost, by my own slowness, these two dates. So I'm going to try to make up on this, and we're going to be adding 27 for this section. Okay. That means simply that. I'm going to push you a little bit harder. And these are the readings. I'm going to send you these readings today. <clears throat> Some of them you have this when you already have. Any questions? Okay. See you on Wednesday. <laughs>